my main screen. Um, and uh, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, meaningful use requirements, just some of them, and how uh, to orchestrate some of these um, requirements within the Cerner environment. Um, <clears throat> we put this together because um, as we go through reports and we look at you know, where people are, uh, we want to make sure that everyone has uh, information um, in order to, uh, to optimize or maximize your potential for meeting meaningful use. And, um, uh, and I expect that uh, after the discussion today that uh, there will probably be some further discussion on how to integrate that into your own personal workflows. And I'm happy to help you with that. Um, I want to thank Mark Walker and John Brooks for um, helping me create this webinar um, and um, for orchestrating the whole process. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. The attendees of uh, this uh, webinar uh, should be uh, eligible providers within the ambulatory care system. Eligible providers are defined as uh, folks who spend between 80 and 90 percent of their uh, clinical time within an ambulatory clinic. Uh, and, um, and performs uh, outpatient visits in that regard. Um, if you're primarily an inpatient hospitalist, then this is not the webinar for you. Um, additionally, clinic staff, front office, registration, back office, MAs, MOAs, um, RNs, and LVNs will benefit from attending this webinar. The objectives today are to discuss the encounter registration updates and demographics, computerized provider order entry, medication reconciliation update, allergies, patient education, tobacco use documentation, checkout protocols update, and finally, a discussion regarding the clinical summary. So let's begin with the encounter registration update. This is not necessarily a meaningful use criteria per se, but um, as a result of, of um, changes that um, effectively affect our ability to track meaningful use, we've had to make changes in um, the that encounters are classified. And what that's done is that's um, uh, created two different encounters. One is the clinic encounter uh, type, um, which must be selected if the patient is going to be seen by a physician, nurse practitioner, or physician assistant. And the new type is the clinic non-provider type. Previously, we had the outpatient type. However, we've changed that and removed the outpatient designation and made a distinction between clinic and clinic non-provider. So clinic non-provider must be selected if the services will not be performed by a physician, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, um, or, for example, if the patient is going to be seen by a nurse, a physical therapist, other therapist, dietitian, lab visit, etc. Uh, so it, during the registration process, um, the uh, registration personnel will notice that there is a patient type, and I'll see if I can point that out using my cursor. Hopefully everyone can see this. Uh, and you'll see two choices between clinic and clinic non-provider. Making the appropriate selection based on the criteria mentioned earlier, um, this will open up a different window which will allow you to um, select either the attending physician, which will be active if you select a clinic patient type, or to complete the rest of the registration process if you chose a clinic non-provider uh, patient uh, encounter type. The attending physician must be entered, entered and that must be the uh, physician, resident, physician assistant, or nurse practitioner, nurse practitioner who actually sees the patient. If the attending physician uh, entered requires a supervising physician, and let's say in the uh, case of a mid-level provider um, in the outpatient clinics, um, then the supervising field, physician field will become mandatory. And this is a new field um, into the system. The attending physician field will be disabled for clinic non-provider visits. 
In addition to uh, completing the rest of the registration, there are demographic fields that must be required uh, in order to meet meaningful use. These fields include gender, date of birth, race, ethnicity, and preferred language. Moving on to a discussion uh, of uh, Computerized Provider Order Entry, or CPOE. The use of CPOE for medication orders uh, directly entered by any licensed um, healthcare person, uh, professional um, by state, local, and professional guidelines. That's our objective. Um, this affects all licensed healthcare professionals who are registered eligible providers. This basically means that we have to put in the majority of our orders ourselves. Um, this does not mean that we can't use standing orders within our outpatient uh, clinics. Um, however, um, this does mean that uh, any orders that are outside of that scope um, need to be entered by the eligible providers themselves. Um, this is a metric that we're actually doing quite well on. Um, however, it must be said that there are probably a few individuals um, who have uh, folks that are entering orders um, who um, are then uh, sending these orders for co-signature, and we want to discourage that as much as possible um, unless uh, it is in the, um, the realm of uh, standing orders. So, um, so that that would apply to vaccines, for example. That that it's better for us to put in the order directly and not have not have the somebody else put it in and then go back and, and sign it later. Exactly, it's right. better to put the uh, vaccines in yourself. And there's a couple of different mechanisms for doing that. What a lot of people are doing is they're setting up um, individual favorites uh, for, for example, pediatric health maintenance. Um, I've seen some examples, and I've done this myself. Uh, where the um, pediatric health maintenance visits are separated out specifically by visit. So you might have a two-month visit, a four-month visit, six-month, and so on. And within that folder, everything that you need um, to complete that visit, including developmental screens, um, which have the information, including um, the uh, appropriate uh, diagnosis codes for billing, um, uh, you know, after six months, uh, the hemoglobin and hematocrit uh, testing, um, fluoride varnish, um, and m coding for visits, whether it's uh, an initial preventive uh, visit versus a uh, periodic preventive visit that's age-specific. Um, all of that um, is in my folder, and I've seen that um, in a number of other uh, folks' folders, um, and it streamlines the process significantly, and that includes all the vaccines. Additionally, I have a, a folder that uh, is just a vaccine folder that has all of the vaccines. Um, in them, just in case you have a child that, um, or any any um, individual that comes in that requires uh, something that um, you know they might need, uh, and it's not specifically in that in that folder. That's like a catch-up vaccine or something. Exactly. Right. So so we can get those off of the shared favorites. We can, you can get those up, off of the shared favorites. Look up your name, and you'll have those folders in there. I have to clean up mine a little bit because I have I have the V20.0 code um, in mine that's set in, um, and uh, so I haven't I haven't done that just yet, um, and I'm just sort of cleaning it up on the back end. But if you go into uh, Dr. Krishnan Cuddy's uh, favorites, um, mm -hmm. she's got a very well organized um, system for managing um, um, preventive health uh, maintenance in, in pediatric patients. All right, thanks. So in the process of completing a CPOE order, um, you select need and um, essentially complete the details, and you'll see different details. Uh, once that has been completed, you click the Sign um, button, and that then um, uh, completes that order. You know that um, the order is complete when you see a check mark, and that also indicates that the CPOE requirement has been met. Let's talk about medication reconciliation. So an eligible provider who receives a patient from another setting of care or provider of care um, or believes that an encounter is relevant should perform a two-step process of medication reconciliation. This 
um, includes medication history and discharge reconciliation. Those are the two steps. There's three situations where this might occur. One situation involves a new patient. Another situation involves a returning patient with new medication. And lastly, um, a patient that has no known medications um, which need to be documented in the system. There's multiple ways to document medications in the system. Um, by selecting the um, medication list plus add um, item off of the menu list, um, you'll be presented with uh, an option to document medication by history. And you want to make this selection off of the list. You want to make sure you don't select the plus add, um, because you will get the add order window. Although if you do that, there is a way to get around um, the, that process and continue to document medications by history. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Once you've entered in the medications, for example, if a patient brings in a uh, bag of uh, pill bottles and you're transcribing that information, or if a medical assistant is doing that for you, um, then the document history button is selected. And, um, and essentially, you've documented uh, that, that information. You know that this information has been documented because you will see a green check mark next to the meds history. Upon completing the meds history, um, what you want to do at the end of the uh, encounter, form what's called a discharge reconciliation. A discharge reconciliation uh, essentially takes all the medication changes that have occurred during that encounter for whatever reason, whether it's documenting home medications or adding new medications that are sent to a pharmacy, and uh, reconciling that um, to the rest of the record. When you select discharge reconciliation, you'll be presented with several options. You'll be able to identify medications that are going out to pharmacies as prescriptions, noted here. You'll be able to see which medications were documented medications. You'll see the scroll next to that. And any medications that were given within the clinic um, as in-clinic medications will also be listed. The idea of this and the point of this window is to make sure that there is a green radio button selected for every column. So in this column, that, that's been satisfied. But we still have four more items that need to have some selection between the three columns. Um, most likely, we would make this selection. And then once we've done that, then we select Reconcile and Sign. If you're not sure which orders need to be reconciled, then you'll notice that there is a button on the left-hand side that says uh, the number of unreconciled orders which need to be reconciled. So once you select Reconcile and Sign, then you'll notice that a green check mark will appear next to the Discharge Meds Rec um, uh, item, and you'll know that that has been completed. Additionally, um, if you select off of medication list uh, and document medication by history, you will be able to see that um, there is an item that you can select um, to check off no known home medications. Um, that's in the upper um, corner of the add plus add window screen. Um, or if you're adding orders directly, you have the option of documenting medication by history by selecting the drop-down box um, in the selector and uh, then entering in medications. When you do that, you will then notice that there is a box that you can check for no known med home medications. I'm going to point you in the direction of this uh, graphic because there is one item that I just wanted to point out as an aside. If you notice that there is a yellow triangle with a red exclamation point, then that itself is a unbillable code, and that needs to be updated. You'll notice that this particular test patient um, has multiple codes, um, and it's just a test patient. But when you see these in your add window screen, add order window screen, then that tells you that this needs to be modified because if you attach any orders to that uh, diagnosis, we will not be able to bill um, using that diagnosis. Once you've completed your entry, then you select Done, and you can move on. 
Let's talk about drug allergies. Excuse me, question. Is it um, not necessary to do the medication reconciliation if you made no changes in the, in the meds for that visit? It's not necessary to, to do the meds reconciliation if there are no changes. However, if you do document compliance, um, which means you go into your medication list, you select um, one or more medications using the right click, you select um, add compliance or document compliance, mm -hmm. and then make a, a, a selection as to their compliance, then you should reconcile that. Okay. I just make a habit uh, personally of uh, doing a reconciliation on every visit, um, and I perform that just before I walk out of the room. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, Sam, does that mean sure. if there's no, no home meds at all and you click that box, you don't have to go back and do the discharge uh, reconciliation? Um, you, you do have the ability to do that, um, and it will document that. However, um, I don't believe that, uh, I think if you, if you do select no known home, home medications, you have to do that at least for that first visit, and then if it, if, it, if it doesn't change with subsequent visits, there's no need to continue to reconcile because there's no change. Okay. All right. Thanks. So getting back to allergies, um, you have to record something um, within the allergies um, listing. And so uh, you'll notice that allergies are not recorded um, in this graphic. And this means that the meaningful use criteria is not satisfied. Meaningful use criteria is satisfied when either an allergy is listed or no known allergies is displayed. So if the patient has no allergies, what you want to do is you want to click on allergies. And you'll notice this uh, menu list. Um, and you'll be able to select just the allergies itself. And when the new window comes up, you'll be able to select no known allergies and uh, that will then uh, document uh, in the chart, and that will satisfy meaningful use. If the patient has allergies to medications, you would click on plus add um, to add allergies. You would then type the name of the allergy substance within the search box, perform your search. Um, you can then um, place a reaction within that box and complete the rest of the field as needed to document that allergy. Um, it should be noted that no known allergy can also be selected from the list of allergies um, if you miss uh, that icon uh, on the regular um, allergies uh, end page. Mm -hmm. So after performing either of the two, you'll notice that um, the patient either is listed as no known allergies or some substance is listed um, that the patient um, will have a documented allergy to. And that will then satisfy meaningful use. Let's talk about patient education. The objective is that the indication um, that specific education is suggested and or provided to the patient by checking the specific patient education in the DPART process. We need to try to satisfy the criteria for this meaningful use measure, and it only requires um, that education was suggested and documented. If the patient refuses the education, or if it is given verbally by the provider, that will meet criteria if the offer of education and the acknowledgement of patient understanding are both checked in power chart. So there's a two-step process uh, for this um, uh, meaningful use criteria. The first is actually establishing the patient education. So on the DPART uh, icon, by selecting that, you get the DPART process window that pops up. And you have an opportunity based on, based on suggested uh, patient education or by selecting uh, patient education from your actual menu uh, page um, above the M page. Uh, you can then select what uh, shows up on the uh, clinical encounter summary. And once that is done, then you've done, um, uh, you've satisfied that measure, and we're 50% there. 
The second part of this is uh, checking a small box that appears at the bottom. And I'm going to go back one slide and show you that there's where the box is. Once that box has been checked, you're stating that the patient verbalized understanding of the instructions given. And you now get credit at that point for meaningful use. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate that process on the screen. So in this particular example, I've got a test patient. And um, what I can do is I can select the patient education. Hopefully everyone can see this. And upon making that selection, I can see the patient education window. And I have options between what's suggested, any departmental options, which uh, should be empty, any personal ones, which I've saved, which should be empty, or using all um, potential patient education materials. I can then make a selection. And I can make a determination as to whether I want this in English or another language. I can select another language, double click that icon, or that option, and I can see that my selection appears in the bottom window. If I want to, I can change any text type or anything like that so that we make this more readable for our patients, especially those with poor vision. If I have selected more than one set of instructions, I can remove a set just in case I don't want that to go out into the encounter summary. Once I've selected that, I then sign um, what I want to enter into the encounter summary, and it should appear in the encounter summary. For most providers, that's all you need to do because the staff um, will usually print out the encounter summary, their clinical summary, before the patient leaves. However, in some cases, um, providers are doing that as well. Um, so let's take a look at the discharge process from that standpoint. By selecting the icon next to the orders bin, and I'm going to go back and redo that. So you can see the orders bin on your dashboard end page. And right next to that is a depart icon. It looks like a little person exiting a door. And you select that. And once you select that, then you will get um, the depart process window that appears. You'll notice that there's an, uh, a band which shows the diagnoses that have been selected, that there are suggested patient education items um, on the list. You can select more if you want, but you'll notice what's been dithered out is the one that I specifically added in, and I can directly print that out. But it, it also shows me that this patient education um, criteria has been satisfied, and the only thing left is to make sure that there is a checkbox in the bottom that shows that the patient verbalizes understanding of the instructions given. If I navigate down this encounter summary, this clinical summary, I can see the information that I've attached to this clinical summary. And of course, it appears in Spanish. Does it matter who presses the patient verbalizes understanding, if it's me or the upfront staff? Um, it should not matter who presses the patient verbalizes understanding. What, what is most important is that the, um, is that, that process is complete um, at the end of the encounter. So in most cases, um, the providers are setting what, uh, what education they want to go out, and the staff is going into the DPART process and printing out that information and giving it to patients before they leave. Um, and uh, part of that process has to include checking that box uh, to make sure that understanding of the instructions were given. <clears throat> so you have a choice to either sign or to sign and print. When, um, when you are printing the information, and this has to be done because we do have to print the clinical summaries, um, this will then document not only um, by, by printing the, the clinical summary, it will also document in your position documentation tab 
um, that, um, that it's been done and you'll get a copy of what was given to the patient. So going back to uh, our PowerPoint, to talk about tobacco use and documentation. The objective for this uh, meaningful use criteria is that all patients age 13 or older must have tobacco use documented in the drop-down. So there's very specific locations as to where that documentation must take place. Um, when you look at your menu list, you'll notice that there's a histories band in the menu list. If you make the selection, then you have tabs within that M page. If you migrate over to the uh, social history, uh, then you will notice that there's an assessment that is listed um, as a column. By selecting the drop-down box in the assessment under tobacco, um, then you can assign risk. Now we haven't, as an institution, um, set levels as to what is directly um, attributable to uh, which, which risk, meaning what is low risk, what is meaning, uh, medium risk, what is high risk. Um, however, um, you want to use um, sort of an educated uh, criteria to, to determine what that risk is and then document it. So once that has been uh, completed, then you'll have an opportunity to place details um, of that risk within the, um, the uh, tobacco section. And it is more important from a meaningful use perspective to make the assessment than to place the details. From a patient care perspective, it is very important to make sure that there are details that are included so anyone else who comes into the chart um, can have an understanding of exactly what this risk uh, means and how it was um, assessed. Moving on to the checkout uh, process, you want to ask yourself a question, and this is really for um, our front and back office personnel. Uh, does the attending provider need to be updated? Sometimes uh, when you are in clinic, you may have a provider who chooses to accept a patient from, uh, for example, in urgent care, or they may help another provider by seeing a patient if that provider is behind schedule. Um, in that case, the attending provider who is listed um, at the beginning of the encounter may need to be updated. It is critically important as to the accuracy of meaningful use data that the actual provider who saw the patient be verified um, at patient checkout and updated if necessary. Prior to selecting DPART in PowerChart, you want to open PM Office in the dialog box um, to the right will be seen. If the patient's being checked out on the same day of service, you click on the PM office conversation and register the patient. You can see this right out here on this window. If they're being checked out the day after service, click on the conversation patient accounting modify, which is circled. And on the screen that appears, update the attending physician to show who actually saw the patient. Now, if the visit has changed because the provider was listed, however, it has now moved to a clinic non-provider uh, visit or vice versa, then you're going to have to make the associated changes to reflect that. But at the end of the encounter, the attending who actually saw the patient must be listed um, so that we give credit where um, credit is supposed to be given. And then you proceed with the rest of the DPART process. The last item for discussion today uh, involves the clinical summary. Now, we've talked a little bit about this during this webinar session, and I wanted to just go back to this um, to talk about um, what to do with this uh, encounter summary. We want to make sure that a patient has or has been offered uh, something to walk out of the encounter with at the end of the encounter. This responsibility in most clinics uh, falls with the uh, DPART uh, personnel or whoever is responsible, whether that's front or back office. Um, and the requirement is that, number one, we make sure that this checkbox is marked, and number two, that we select the sign and print so that we can print um, to the appropriate printer 
and have something to give the patient um, at the end of the encounter. You'll notice that once that um, job has been uh, completed, that if you navigate over to the physician documentation section on your menu list, um, you will see what is shown as the ambulatory clinical summary. Um, that should be encounter specific, so every encounter should have an, an ambulatory clinical summary attached to it to show that the patient was offered information regarding their clinical visit during the encounter. Um, this will also show that it has been verified because the appropriate um, items have been checked and selected. So this ends the uh, Meaningful Use webinar, um, and I want to open up uh, to any questions that anyone might have before we sign off for the afternoon.